Hello there. Um, so I know you guys are probably uh, kind of tired and worn out from ISTEP today, uh, but I especially want to do make this video and go over this since, uh, especially given the news now that we uh, will be having a gold day on Wednesday instead of a blue day, I won't see you and we won't really have time in class to talk about any of this stuff. Uh, I want to go over and review some important concepts for the Gilded Age test, which I'm going to unlock and open on, I think, Thursday. Um, so check Canvas for that. Uh, this test is actually going to be a bit shorter. It's only going to be four questions instead of uh, five or six, like usual. But it's going to follow the same format, you know, um, extended response, support all your responses with uh, examples and specific examples. It's open book, open note. Um, so nothing you haven't seen before. Uh, but I want to go over some of the topics and major things to be aware of for the test. So uh, first major topic to know is uh, all the stuff about monopolies and corporatism, or another way to phrase it is corporate welfare. So um, the Gilded Age refers to the era after the Civil War, where the U.S. fully could effectively fully completed the transition to an industrial capitalist economy. And American industrial capitalism relied on an intertwining of business and government to advance business interests. So this relationship took the form of things like uh, subsidies where the government uh, would uh, help finance or subsidize uh, investment or startup costs for businesses. Uh, a good example of this would be uh, railroads where a lot of railroads got subsidized by the government who paid their startup costs and then after uh, the government basically paid for them to get started. Uh, the business itself was able to keep all the profits. Uh, tax breaks as well, where the government would give businesses uh, tax cuts or exempt them from certain taxes uh, to stimulate economic activity. Uh, things like no-bid contracts, a good example being uh, Credit Mobilier and the Credit Mobilier company, where you had companies that were uh, getting government contracts without having to go through the formal bidding process. The way it's supposed to work and the way it normally works, well, I can't even say normally works, but the way it's supposed to work is uh, when the government needs to hire a company uh, to do a job, uh, generally they'll say, this is what the job is, uh, who can do this for the lowest price uh, within our constraints? And any company that's interested would bid for the government's business. Uh, by having no bid contracts, it effectively allows companies to overcharge the government uh, because they know that they're guaranteed to get the business. They don't have to compete with uh, any other companies. Um, so the Credit Mobilier scandal is a good example of that, where, again, you had a railroad company that was getting no bid contracts in the from the government. And in the process of that, uh, kind of because of that, radically overcharging the government by a lot. Um, and also, and this one really especially applies to railroads, land grants, where the government, instead of making the railroads buy the land they were on it to build the railroad on, the government just gave them the land, uh, arguing that, well, this is going to be in the public interest, so let's just give them the land so we can get this railroad built. Uh, but again, it kind of goes back to the earlier example of subsidies where uh, the government subsidized the, the cost by giving them the land, and yet they were still able to keep the profits. Um, American capitalism focused on heavy industry. So this would, these would not necessarily be things like consumer goods, but the things that drove the economy were railroads, steel, and oil. Those were the three core industries. Um, and there really was kind of a general uh, progression in terms of which one, in, in ter or in terms of how these industries uh, fed into each other. So the railroads were the first major industry of American industrial capitalism to get established. Really during the Civil War, because of all the government subsidies and the uh, intense just all the tax breaks and subsidies and land grants available to companies that wanted to build railroads out west. Um, there was a massive um, just 
a massive growth growth spurt, growth spurt of railroad building out west uh, to the point where actually the railroads were overproduced. Uh, the supply exceeded the demand. So a lot of these railroads wound up losing money. But the money that was made by the successful ones wound up helping to finance the uh, startup capital for later industries. Great example of this is Andrew Carnegie. When he gets here, when he gets to the U.S. Uh, after emigra emigrating from Scotland, he goes to work on a railroad, and there he makes contact with railroad executives who give him the startup money so he can start his company, Carnegie Steel. So really what we see there and with Carnegie's story is you have the capital and the money from these earlier industries like railroads going to finance the development of later industries like steel which, uh, again, helped further develop this industrial economy. Uh, in this industrial economy, one of the other defining features was the rise of monopolies, particularly amongst the heavy industries. So a monopoly, to uh, review, is when you have one company that dominates an enterprise, um, when it comes to capitalism, monopolies are generally actually considered to be bad and uh, kind of anti-capitalist because if you have one company that controls an industry, by definition, you don't have the competition that advocates of capitalism argue makes it such a viable system. Uh, that effectively creates a situation where the company does not have to innovate and can overcharge its customers because there's no competition. Uh, there's no one around them offering a better product or um, offering lower prices. There are generally two types of monopolies. One is vertical integration, where the company is involved in all aspects of production. Uh, and the goal of a, ver of a company that is vertically integrated is self-sufficiency. Prime example, Andrew Carnegie and Carnegie Steel. Um, so a good example to kind of illustrate how, what this worked. Uh, Carnegie sought to cut out uh, middlemen to make his business entirely self-sufficient on himself and to uh, keep production costs low to maximize profits. So when we say he is involved in all aspects of Production, meaning Carnegie owned mines to mine the iron ore and the raw materials used to make steel. He owned the ships and the shipping companies to transport the ore to his factories. He owned the mills to actually turn it into steel. He owned transport companies and warehouses to store and transport the steel to market. So the whole point of that was to cut out middlemen and to keep production costs low because, again, you don't have these separate companies charging more money to make profits. Um, the other type of uh, monopoly is horizontal integration, which is generally looked on a lot less favorable favorably than vertical integration. Done right, vertical integration can actually uh, serve the interests of both the business and the consumer. Because, it's a, again, since it keeps production costs low, it can also uh, result in cheaper prices for the customer. Horizontal integration, by contrast, is where you have one company that controls one aspect of production. And the goal of a horizontally integrated company is to prevent competition. Best example of horizontal integration is, uh, is John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil. At its height, Standard Oil controlled over 90% of oil refining in the U.S. So when it came to oil production, uh, Rockefeller and Standard Oil didn't get involved in other aspects of oil. They only focused on oil refining. And uh, basically, they would create a bottleneck through oil refining, where if you were involved in oil, at some point, you have to go through them and they're going to get a piece of your business. Um, so the criticisms of horizontal integration, when you have a company that controls just such a disproportionate share of the market, 
is it gives that company too much power and it effectively breaks the model of competition, which we see in Rockefeller's business practices uh, during his time as president of Standard Oil. And the George Rice source really gives a good example of that, how when Rockefeller was trying to um, eliminate competition, if he couldn't just outright buy the company or buy his competitors, uh, he would generally uh, cut prices in uh, his competitors' areas of business to the point where he was losing money. But since he was so big and controlled so much of a share of the market, he could afford to take the hit short term. Uh, he, could, he was also able to charge lower prices because he was getting special rebates from the railroads, which again allowed him to undercut his competitors and drive them out of business. Um, only to the point where once the competitors are out of business, uh, Standard would raise the prices because there was no one to compete with them. Okay. Uh, next major topic to look at are these early efforts at reform and business regulations. There are three of them to pay attention to. First is the Pendleton Civil Service Act, which uh, was passed by Chester Allen Arthur to establish the Civil Service Commission. Uh, this was the act passed in response to the assassination of President Garfield by a disgruntled and mentally ill office seeker who uh, wanted, wanted Garfield to utilize the spoils system that was in place at the time to just give him a government job. And the whole point of the Pendleton Civil Service Act was to professionalize the civil service. They wa it wanted to get rid of the spoils system, where under the spoils system, you would get government jobs through your connections to politicians and higher ranking party officials. And it was effectively a way to reward loyalty and party service by giving them job by giving people jobs with the Pendleton Civil Service Act and the establishment of the Civil Service Commission. It was a way to try and make the civil service more of a meritocracy where instead of getting your job based on your political connections and your loyalty to politicians, you instead got your job uh, based on merit. And uh, one of the main restrictions put in place by this uh, law was uh, that that was a ban on government employees donating to political campaigns as a me as a way to try and prevent undue influence from government employees on politicians. They were no longer allowed to donate to campaigns uh, as a way to try and further separate uh, politicians and those people who were elected by elected. Uh, versus those people who just got regular jobs and did the day-to-day -day work to make the government work, to make the government function. Next major law to pay attention to is the Interstate Commerce Act, which established the Interstate Commerce Commission. And this was a really significant piece of legislation because it was the first major attempt by the government to regulate business. It was only moderately effective, not nearly as effective as the Pendleton Civil Service Act, which by and large, uh, succeeded in professionalizing the civil service. Uh, the pieces of the interstate, the pieces were there to effectively accomplish the purpose. However, the main uh, hurdle that the Interstate Commerce Act couldn't overcome was the way, was the makeup of the Interstate Commerce Commission. Uh, so the main goal of this act was to regulate railroads and uh, because through the appointment process, uh, most of the time, most of the people on the Interstate Commerce Commission had ties to the railroads, which uh, disincentivized them to actually try and impose um, really stringent regulation on the railroads. So the pieces were there, uh, but because of the people who were on the Interstate Commerce Commission and their ties to business, um, there really was minimal regulation going on. And the last law to pay attention to is the Sherman Antitrust Act, which is significant because it was the first major piece of antitrust legislation passed in the United States. And the goal was to allow the government to break up monopolies, specifically those utilizing the trust model of organization, where basically there were all these different companies that were uh, 
effectively run by the same group of people and collaborating uh, together as an industry. The Sherman Antitrust Act was designed to uh, break those type of monopolies up. Uh, the, however, the biggest issue with this law was that um, there really wasn't it wasn't strong enough. It lacked the teeth to really make a lasting impact on uh, regulating business, although it was uh, over predominantly used to regulate and break up labor unions. Uh, so that was kind of a law that got twisted around for different purposes. Uh, but it was still an important first step and an important symbolic measure. Okay, next major thing to pay attention to is just the changes to the lifestyle and the culture of the time, of the period. Um, and depending on what your class was, you experienced the Gilded Age uh, very differently depending on your social class. Uh, so middle class and higher, their standard of living increased. These people predominantly worked uh, white collar jobs. Uh, so uh, white collar jobs generally think of like uh, managers or management um, or office workers or the professions. Um, these jobs typically offered higher pay with shorter working hours and less strenuous working conditions because again, they're generally office jobs or if you are working in a factory, you're the supervisor or you're a manager. And the big barrier to these jobs uh, for most people was that they typically required some advanced education. When I say advanced education, I'm not talking about college. I'm talking about high school. Um, at, the at this point in history, most Americans honestly didn't even graduate from high school. So a lot of these white collar jobs uh, required would, would, would require at least a high school diploma to uh, get. And again, now if you look at the modern economy, most of these jobs now require like uh, bachelor's degrees or even higher. But um, during the Gilded Age, uh, the advanced education what required was just uh, high school. And most of the people who had these jobs, they were overwhelmingly uh, white. And uh, not, well, not even just white, but uh, Long families who had been in the U.S. for a long period of time, who had been established, who become established in the U.S., uh, most often Protestants. Uh, so, kind of what you generally think of as just kind of standard, like average white Americans. Uh, those would generally be the people who would have these middle class jobs, and their standard of living, uh, they were able to fully take advantage of the fruits of this massive expansion of manufacturing and industry. Uh, the development of mass manufacturing methods not only increased the availability and the different types of consumer goods available, but it also made them cheaper. So a lot of these consumer and luxury goods were now available to middle-class Americans, um, and they could afford them uh, to have a pretty marked impact on their life. Also, because of their shorter working hours, they were generally able to engage in more leisure activities. Um, so this is where you really start to see things like baseball become uh, America's pastime. And you have the development of things like amusement parks and public museums and libraries where... Uh, this was the class, this was the group of people that was truly able to take advantage of the abundance and, pro and economic prosperity of the period and also reap the full rewards of the philanthropic efforts of uh, the we of wealthy people like Andrew Carnegie. Um, contrasted with the middle class, you have the working class who actually had a decreased standard of living. Uh, so working class, these guys were predominantly blue collar workers. Um, and even then, uh, predominantly unskilled laborers. And that was kind of a defining trend of the economic development of the period, where in an attempt to make manufacturing faster and cheaper and easier, again, to maximize profits, 
um, manufacturers uh, increasingly tried to tear to turn uh, tasks for being skilled or requiring uh, skilled labor to being uh, unskilled, where unskilled workers could could complete them. And the main way to do this was through mechanization by introducing more machines into the working environment um, and into the manufacturing process. This sped up the manufacturing process because, again, machines are just more efficient at physical tasks than humans. But also, it um, makes the manufacturing process easier because you now no longer need to take uh, need to have skilled workers who know how to do the thing that you want them to do. Instead, they just need to know how to run the machines. Uh, so the uh, the Joseph Finnerty source is a prime example of that, where he mentions that through mechanization, a lot of the guys he worked with, with he no, was no longer working with skilled workers who knew how to work with brass and uh, build a chandelier entirely by themselves. Instead, he was working with unskilled workers who really only knew how to run the machines to make the chandelier or to make the parts of the chandeliers. Um, so again, that has a double impact where yes, it, 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 it makes consumer goods more available. It makes them cheaper, but it also um, transforms the work environment. It gives the individual worker less uh, influence and leverage over their employer and it allows employers to cut wages. Uh, so the working class, these blue collar jobs generally were offered lower pay for longer hours and more dangerous working conditions. Again, Finnerty mentions how the average life expectancy in his profession was between like 35 and 40 because they were constantly breathing in the fumes. Uh, the working class was most commonly, or, or, let, me rephrase, let me rephrase that, uh, most new immigrants were working class. So the less established groups in the US formed the working class. Um, hence, predominantly immigrants or first generation Americans, who basically the children of immigrants would predominantly be working class. And again, their standards of living decreased because not only did they have less leisure time and lower pay, their, uh, their uh, dwellings decreased. Uh, hence why you have the descriptions of uh, the tenements that lacked amenities like um, indoor plumbing and electricity when electricity did become available in the, 90, in the 1890s. Um, and the working class really does kind of, uh, stand out. I forget. There was that one, there was a, a quote from that one worker, uh, in Rourke that, uh, I think does summarize the, uh, how they really did not have the same, uh, leisure time as the middle class did where, uh, the worker was commenting on how Carnegie donates all this money to build a public library, and yet the workers, his own employees, uh, were not able to really go or use this library that he built uh, because they worked too much. Um, and on their day off Sunday, the library was closed. So they really did not have the same opportunities or the same lifestyle as the middle class. There was a vast gap between uh, rich and poor during this period. However, another group that gained economic opportunities, interestingly enough, was women with the expansion of what are known as pink collar jobs, or uh, rather professions that were dominated by women, uh, examples being like secretaries and teachers. And these jobs were really kind of interesting. The expansion of these jobs uh, coincided with the expansion of uh, the more uh, with just the expansion of industrial capitalism and uh, office and clerical work with more clerical work needing to be done. While it wasn't super difficult, you still needed people who were educated. And this is kind of how secretaries uh, became female dominated professions. Because they were jobs that required education because you had to be able to read and do all this uh, 
like mental labor. And yet, uh, employers generally didn't want to pay these workers that much. And women offered them an easy solution to this. Uh, whereas these jobs, since they were, if they hired women, they could pay them less. Uh, but it was easier to get educated women to do this work because there was an opportunity they previously did not have. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Okay. And then the last topic to look at would be uh, the labor movement and the emergence of labor unions. And specifically, uh, kind of a comparison between the two main unions during this period, the Knights of Labor and the American Federation of Labor. Um, so the Knights of Labor, they advocated for massive social and economic change. Uh, while not as hardcore as the industrial workers of the world, uh, for the time being, the Knights of Labor were, were the most radical labor organization. Uh, their general philosophy could be summed up in a desire to democratize the workplace. They wanted to effectively get rid of the standard capitalist um, organization of businesses where you have the capitalist who owns the business and who uh, invested to start the business, and then the work, the employees who he pays to do the work. Um, instead, arguing that uh, the workplace should be democratized, where you shouldn't have owners and workers. Instead, that the the workers should be the owners, and that the workers should effectively choose their own managers and supervisors. Uh, So kind of similar to uh, the philosophy of democratic socialism that you hear about uh, today in some policies you'll see in other countries. Like I know, I think in Germany, for example, uh, today, there's a law which requires 50% of corporate boards be made up of workers and the people that actually work in the company and the other 50% can be investors. Um, the Knights of Labor were also radical because they were a union that was open to all workers, um, skilled or unskilled, men and women, uh, minorities, Im immigrants, black Americans, all different workers. If you were a worker, you could join the Knights of Labor. Uh, the only classes that were the only people that were banned from joining the Knights of Labor would be uh, people like lawyers, bankers, and speculators, and financiers. People who, according to their manifesto, didn't produce anything and just leached off of other people to enrich themselves. Um, so the Knights of Labor were a lot more confrontational. They were more willing to engage in protests, rallies, and strikes than the AFL. And speaking of the AFL, the American Federation of Labor was a lot more... Uh, was a lot less ambitious in its objectives, and they instead advocated for more focused reforms. They didn't want to change the system the way the Knights of Labor did. They just wanted to fix the system, take the flaws and make it better. So whereas the Knights of Labor want to totally transform the nature of ownership, the American Federation of Labor wanted to... Uh, Focus on things like uh, reforming and regulating working hours, like leading the charge on movements like the eight-hour workday movement, or leading the charge on establishing a minimum wage. Um, the AFL was only open to skilled workers, and again, they viewed the Knights of Labor allowing unskilled workers in and women in as a uh, radical, which at the time it was. Um, notably, the AFL opposed uh, equal pay reforms, where basically uh, reforms aimed at uh, providing women with equal pay for equal work. The Knights of Labor, however, did uh, support that. And the American Federation of Labor was less confrontational. They, less, they were less willing to engage in strikes. They more um, they favored utilizing 
uh, negotiations and collective bargaining more than the, the Knights of Labor. And because the AFL was composed of skilled workers, it was easier for them to get what they wanted through uh, collective bargaining because skilled workers were much more difficult to replace than unskilled workers. Um, so because of that, simply by being able to bargain as a collective, that gave them a massive advantage compared to the mass of laborers uh, that the Knights of Labor represented. It's all because again, it's a lot easier to replace an unskilled worker than it is to replace a skilled worker. And the American Federation of Labor ultimately proved to be the more successful of the two as uh, the chaos and the aftermath of the Haymarket bombing uh, really gave the public a distaste for groups like the Knights of Labor and more radical groups. Um, and the public was generally a bit more favorable of the more moderate and focused groups like the American Federation of Labor. Uh, so that covers all the major topics that will be on the test. If you have questions, email me. Um, let me know about that. I'm still waiting to get emails about or to hear about uh, article choices um, to see what you guys are finding for your research practice assignment. Do not put that off because if your article if I don't approve your article, you're going to need to find another one. Uh, and again, if you have questions about that, let me know since we won't really be in class because of the wonderful, well, because of the wonders of I-STEP testing. Um, I think that's it. So uh, yeah, we're going to keep moving forward. Uh, so make sure you also get Rourke chapter 20 read. You'll get another video. Uh, tomorrow, kind of covering uh, the populist movement and uh, American imperialism, which are two topics that are kind of interesting to get to pair together, but uh, Rourke pairs them together. So that's kind of how I'll cover that. And we are moving into our third unit over progressivism and the progressive movement. So uh, fun, moving along, moving along. So I will talk to you guys later then.